my name is Chris Harrison, I'm from AlloryTutors.com and welcome to this video on polymers. Now this video is mainly aimed at those who are um, studying polymers at AS level, so in particular I know this video will be really useful for those studying OCR chemistry, because uh, you need to know how alkenes can form polymers, um, but you need to check your specifications to make sure that the actual polymers section uh, does it actually exist in the AS syllabus. Okay, so uh, what we're going to look at is uh, what polymer is, how we can uh, link them together, uh, so how we can link monomers together to form polymers, and we're also going to look at the uh, the green chemistry side as well, looking at uh, how we can dispose of these properly and why we dispose of them in certain ways. Okay, so let's start by looking at what a polymer is. So polymer is basically many monomers joining together. That's what poly means, so poly means lots of. And uh, for this example, we're going to look at addition polymers, polymerization. So this means adding an alkene uh, or opening up an alkene and joining them together to form longer alkane chains. So um, we've got here, this is um, ethene, which is um, this molecule here, so C2H4. Uh, we can open this uh, double bond up and form the polymer chain. Now, this is a repeat unit, um, and I'll add that on there as well. So this bit is called the repeat unit. Um, and this is basically the unit that repeats over and over and over again a number of times. And this N bit here uh, tells us how many times, basically represents the number of times this monomer is repeated. So we'll put that on there. So this is the uh, number uh, of repeat units. Uh, and this is normally represented by N because we've got so many of these joined together it's not really feasible to put a number next to that. Uh, you can also notice some other things as well, that now the double bond is officially gone uh, because that's been now opened up to form a polymer, but also we have brackets. So make sure you include brackets to show, just segregates the repeat units. So we'll put brackets there. Uh, and also you see that we've got these, which are called trailing bonds. So you must include these as well. Um, the trailing bonds, basically shows that actually this uh, repeat unit here is joined by other repeat units left and right to it to form the polymer chain. So it's really important that you draw this correctly as well. Uh, this one in this case is called ethene and in terms of nomenclature, let's put this in blue, we'll call this ethene, this one's ethene. Uh, this one is called poly and then in brackets we put ethene. So we still keep the E bit, but it's very important to put the word poly in front of it. And that just tells us we have lots of ethene molecules that were ethene molecules joining together to form this polymer. Um, you can also work backwards as well. So here we've got our uh, polymer um, repeat unit, and we're going to put N on there. Um, so this is repeating a number of times. And we can have a look at this and we can try and work out what the monomer unit was, we work backwards. Now you can see here, we've drawn CH3, CH3 here. So if I was to draw a long chain like this, you can see this is but because uh, it's got four carbons. Um, but crucially, you need to know where the double bond is because it could be but one in or but two in. Um, in this case, it's actually but two in. The reason why is you can see here we've got CH3 single bond CH, but the double bond would be here, and this is between the second and third carbon. So you can see here this would have been but two in and not but one in. That's really, really important that you really look out for where the double bond was in the monomer unit. So we're going to draw out the monomer unit here, and sometimes it helps to literally draw it out as you see it. There. And so this is what the uh, monomer unit would look like for uh, butene. Obviously, this is exactly the same as if we draw it, drew it in a straight line. And the big mistake with polymers is to kind of get all this mixed up and really just look for the longest carbon chain and try and find where that double bond is located. This is butene, as you can see here. Okay, so obviously those are um, different types of um, polymers there, and uh, the monomer units that make it up. We're now we're going to look at uh, the disposal of these things. Obviously, plastics are absolutely everywhere. They're on the glasses, they make t-shirts, uh, they make plastic bottles like this, like drinks bottles, uh, which are useful um, for storing drinks in the really lightweight. Make the pens that we do, so everything that we have just about uh, is made from some kind of plastic. 
Now this can pose a problem when we want to get rid of them. Uh, and we have various different methods of disposing, disposing of them other than just recycling, which is probably the, the, the common one that you may have heard of. So for example, we can obviously recycle in one way is reusing the plastic. And that's one of the most, uh, we think is one of the most environmentally friendly ways because we're not using up um, crude oil to make plastic things like this. And we're actually reusing uh, items that we've already made. So they can be recycled by remodeling them or remolding them. Uh, for example, polypropene can be remolded. We melt it down, chip it up, and then remold it into something new. Again, we're not using uh, scarce resources like crude oil to do that. We're just using something that's already been used. So there's an advantage there. Uh, and it can be cracked into smaller monomer units as well. So for example, if you say you want this pen, which is quite a rigid type of plastic, and you want to make uh, a different type of plastic altogether, we can break this up. Uh, into the monomer units back again, what we looked at here, and form uh, a new polymer chain with different properties, uh, which obviously can be useful if the market demands that. Now, the problem is with recycling is that you need to separate these items out, and uh, it's not all plastics can be recycled, as you'll see in a minute. So there is a cost aspect to this as well, and obviously there is energy needed to be put in to melt the plastics in the first place, then to remold them. So it's not completely environmentally friendly, um, but it could potentially be better than a landfill, which is our next one. Uh, and this is just burying the waste under a big, in a big hole under the ground. Uh, this is very expensive and um, is not it's something that we're trying to move away from as well. Uh, the plastics really don't degrade that much. They really struggle to degrade. They are very, very stable and they're unreactive. So that's a really important point. Um, they are used for plastics that are difficult to separate from other waste. So, for example, you might have um, plastic components within um, a metal structure, for example. For example, like a car, uh, you've got a metal casing, got plastics everywhere within the engine, within the, uh, the actual main dashboard. You've got them tucked under the car, so they're absolutely everywhere. And sometimes it's really difficult to really separate everything out from the car. Uh, they'll take as much as they can out of it. But it's the same same with this here, and sometimes it just gets put into landfill instead. Um, it might be the case that it's too difficult to recycle as well. There's certain things that you can't recycle, um, or it's really difficult to recycle, in which case we don't really have much um, to do with it. We can't really do much with it other than to put it into a hole and just um, let it sit there. But the problem is they don't degrade very well, and they're very stable molecules. Um, but there is a solution to that, as we'll come on to in a minute. And the last one is burning. Uh, this is combustion or incinerating uh, plastics. Uh, it's really good for generating electricity and it's something that um, uh, has been going on for a few years now. Um, however, there are big downsides with it and the fact that when you burn plastics, you do produce some toxic fumes and you have to burn it uh, responsibly and make sure that you are handling any byproducts that come off when you're burning the plastic in a uh, sustainable way. Uh, and one of the things, for example, is PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride. Burning that can release hydrogen chloride gas, which is really acidic uh, and is really not good for you whatsoever. So the company, if they are going to incinerate uh, plastics, you've got to make sure they may remove plastics like PVC or they have things in place to manage the hydrogen chloride gas that is produced. Um, and these things, one of the ways they can do is they can put them through what we call flue gas scrubbers. Uh, and this can trap some of the harmful emissions that we produce uh, and maybe resell it. For example, HCl could be dissolved in water and you could uh, form hydrochloric acid and potentially sell that. So there could be ways around this as well, but it's an alternative and it's a way in which we can make electricity as well, again, without using any um, fossil fuels to make the electricity. Uh, the last bit really is biodegradable plastics. Now these are really interesting and are quite, um, quite a, a new bit of technology as well. And they work by organisms digesting them. So when you um, when you put them into a, into a pile or treat them in a very specific way, you can put organisms in there like bacteria and fungi, uh, and these can help break down the plastics, uh, which is obviously a good thing because non-biodegradable plastics take thousands of years to degrade, whereas biodegradables um, could maybe decompose within five to ten years, uh, which is a lot shorter than the uh, longer um, non-biodegradable ones. So they're made from renewable sources. For example, you could use things like um, starch, uh, and starch can be found from certain plants, so wheat and maize, etc. Um, and you can also use uh, non-biodegradable, uh, sorry, you can also use non-renewable sources as well, so like crude oil. Very certain fractions can be used to make uh, biodegradable plastics, which is which could be quite useful.
Um, it's not the case though that if you take these biodegradable plastics, put them in a hole and they'll just decompose, that isn't the case. Um, you need to actually chop these up, uh, break them up into little bits, into little chunks, uh, and then you need lots of moisture and oxygen to allow the bacteria or the organisms to uh, feed from this, uh, from these plastics and allow them to degrade. And then this can then be, once it's been turned over a few times, and it might take a while to do this, these big digesters, we can then uh, use it as a, um, as like a compost almost, uh, and then return it back into the land with all the nutrients. So there's obviously a benefit there, but it is very slow um, at doing this. Um, the uses of these that could be used to make things like carrier bags, you might have seen them in supermarkets, uh, although end up with the new um, uh, the carrier bag charge now, um, this is a way in which they're trying to reduce this, but before the carrier bag charge we did have some uh, biodegradable bags, um, we still do actually on the market. Uh, also things like credit cards as well, and that seems a bit odd, but you only have a credit card for maybe two or three years or a bank card, uh, and then you get a new one. So imagine the amount of bank cards that are being disposed of, uh, anything that you don't need for a long period of time, like carrier bags and credit cards, you can make from a biodegradable plastic because it will degrade after 10 years when you don't need it anyway. So that would be really, really beneficial. And the last bit as well, really, is um, a new thing called photodegradable polymers. Uh, now, these are basically polymers that degrade in sunlight. Um, these can be really useful on things like plasters in particular, because, uh, you know, when you've got a plaster and you've got the adhesive that sticks uh, onto the skin when you stick the plaster on, um, this adhesive could potentially break down when you release the top layer off the plaster, let the light, uh, uh, let the glue or the adhesive that stick in the plastic to your skin uh, be exposed to the light and this could break down the adhesive, make it less sticky so it's really easy to peel off. This could be beneficial in places like hospitals uh, where you might have a really um, sore wound underneath and the last thing you want to do is really tug at it to try and pull the uh, dressing off it so uh, there could be a use there as well and obviously many other uses um, in the future could be used for photodegradable plastics so you can see there's a real future for plastics and um, they are becoming uh, more environmentally friendly and a more sustainable alternative uh, compared to some of the older plastics which we may see phased out um, some of these older traditional non-degradable plastics maybe uh, in the very near future so um, lots of technology going into polymers at the minute and you do need to know that these can be formed from alkenes and that's where it fits in with the alkene topic. That's it now. Bye bye.